uh, it's important, you know, that, that we, we learn what it means to stay the course and uh, for you to be committed and understand the commitment level that it takes to stay the course. Because it's so easy, you know, to fall out. The Apostle Paul wrote about how many people had made shipwreck of their faith. You know, they, it's like a ship that just wrecks, a ship without, without direction and without you know, purpose. And so I want to focus these messages on that very theme, that very idea of, of not failing and not turning back. Let's look in their, their passage. We'll be looking at it for all six weeks of the study. We'll be Second Peter in chapter 1 as Paul writes his second letter. Now, years ago, I think maybe 10, 12 years ago, I, I preached through the whole book of, of Second Peter. And we dealt with this in, in, in brief passing. But it, there's so much there. I've shared this element of this in pastors conferences and in other places even in youth conferences about how, how to get to, how do you how do you get through make the journey all the way to the end so let's look in these passages we share this morning in second peter chapter 1 verses 2 through 11 where he says grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of god and of jesus our lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted unto us precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Now catch this verse. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten about his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his, your, his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, again, the objective of what we're talking about in this message and the series of this message kind of finalizes itself there in verse 8, which says if these qualities, and he's listed seven things there that are part of our character and, and part of our, our, our life. He says, if these qualities are in you and they're yours and they are increasing, then you, you, you won't become useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's giving us here the method for not being useless and the method for being fruitful and this method for having the kingdom supplied unto us, that God's doing some abundant work in our, in, in our life as well. And he goes back, let me take it back to some verses. He says, for this reason, give all diligence to add to your faith. In other words, you know the Lord, you've come to Christ. Now there's some things you need to know that you've come to Christ that will help you to live a kind of life that won't be an embarrassment to the kingdom of God or to yourself or that you won't be ashamed of. And hopefully... I think that every Christian has deep, this, this desire deep in his heart and spirit that one day when we do stand before God and we all will and we stand at the judgment seat of Christ that we'll be able to hear from the Lord's lips, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I mean, isn't that your heart and isn't that your passion? Says, so for this reason, so as to not stumble, so as to not fail, give all diligence to add to your faith. Now there's this phrase where, 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 where he, he deals with uh, that I want you to catch. He says, and besides this, what it says, I think in the King James in verse five, besides this, give all diligence. What is this it's talking about? What, what's, what's the motivation or what's the reasoning he, he's getting into there? And he's pointing back to, to verse three, ultimately he says, he says, besides what? What is the, this he's talking about this or for this, the reason he's talking about? He says, the reason is his divine power has granted to you everything that pertains to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who's called you by his own glory and his own excellence. In other words, he's talking about, he said, now you have this faith, you're a believer in Christ, give all diligence to add to this. And, and why are we doing it? Because, because of this, because God's given you everything you need to win this race. God's given you everything you need to succeed. 
But you need to understand that as you, as you move forward from here to add these things to your faith, understand this verse 3 is because that's the premise on which some of these things are built where he's in verse 3. This is the reason. This is, the way, this is why we can add to our faith. This is why we can, this is why we can succeed. This is why we're going to be able to make it to the end. And, and what's the reason? Well, let me break this, this verse down today. This will be the, the, the foundation for our study that we, I want you to get because if you miss this part, the other part won't be very useful to you. It'll always be this question. There are four words, power and promise, participation and protection. These are the four things that are highlighted in verse three that help us to be able to come to the place that I can add to my faith all these elements, all these seven characteristics that he's talking about. Let's look at the first thing out of this verse when he says, you know, for this very reason. The first part has to do with God's power, all right? That God has given us his power. He said, you know, he said that God's power has been available to us. In fact, it's a divine power that God's dealing with. His divine power has provided everything we need, he says in this verse, for life, that's Zoe life, and godliness. That's the, that's the outward life before others. They can see the glory and the grace of God. This power has been given to us. God's made available to us. It's the power of God. In fact, as I said, the word here is, is this word dunamis for power. We've talked about that before. We get that word dynamite from. But it's not just power. It's not just dunamis. It's theos dunamis. And this is, this is divine power that God's given us, all right? That's the source of this power. The source is that this, this power, this dunamis, this strength and grace we need comes from God himself. It's not like any other power. It's that power mentioned in Ephesians. And, and Tim's been teaching Ephesians, but in chapter one it says, this is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us that believe. Paul's saying, hey, there's a great power that God has given to all those people who committed their lives to Christ. And what about this power? It's in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. In other words, the power that God is making available to us so that we can add these things to our faith so that we can succeed ultimately, the power that God makes available is divine power. It is power which is God's power. It's not power like in the world. It hasn't have to do with your ability to say, I'm going to feel powerful today and I'm going to get through this and I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps and bless God, I'm going to succeed for the glory. No, he said, this is, this is greater than all those things. This is a divine, supernatural power that comes and, and emanates from God himself and it's toward those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. This is the word that Paul if you're familiar in Acts chapter 17, when Paul is in Athens and he goes up to Mars Hill and on Mars Hill, we've discussed before about all these statues that were made to the Greek mythological gods, you know, Zeus and all these, Diana and all these gods, they have a statue to every one of them up on Mars Hill. In fact, there were so many statues made to these deities on Mars Hill that the city council of Athens says enough statues. And they passed an ordinance that says no more statues. What we're going to do, is we're just going to make everybody happy. We're going to make one more statue, one more monument, and we'll title it to the unknown God. And that'll make everybody happy. So if you want, if you want a statue and an ordinance, it's all taken care of. That's yours right there, unknown God. So they built all these statues. Here's this one, the unknown God. And this place up on Mars Hill where the Parthenon is and this massive buildings, and these massive statues were everywhere. All the great intellects, so to say, and the philosophers and the wise men of the world would gather regularly up on Mars Hill to have their discussions. Everywhere you looked, it looked like you were at Starbucks and people were having religious discussions, all right? They're all standing around on these different deities and they're all talking. Great groups would congregate. Orators would get up and speak to the crowds and the Greeks were very proud of their oratory skills, you know. And it'd be Socrates or all the other philosophers would be quoted and mentioned as they would go down the list. Paul goes up to Mars Hill, stands up to preach, and he begins to preach. And he says to these people on Mars Hill, the great minds and thinkers of the day, this time of ignorance, God has winked at. All right? In other words, it's now time to pay attention to the truth. And he talks about the unknown God. He said the unknown God is ultimately the true God that's not known by people. It's not that he doesn't want to be known. He says, it's in him that we live, we move, we have our being. God created us all. We're children of God. Really, we come from God. And then he begins to talk about Jesus Christ. 
and who, who, who is the, the true God. And he starts talking about, and he uses in, this, in, in chapter 17, this, this, this word theos dunamis. He says to the people on Mars, we're children of God. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or any image that can be formed by thought of man or by art. In other words, you're not going to capture God in a piece of rock. You're not going to capture God in a sculpture. You're not going to capture God in your so-called deep thinking. The divine nature is not like what men perceive. Now, that, that's his description. He's talking about the almighty, all-powerful God over all things. It is the same terminology that he uses and that Peter uses when he talks to us about the power that God raised Jesus from the dead and the same power that is available to you and to me as Christians. So what, well, how's that relevant to me? It's relevant because you need to understand that you're not going to live a successful Christian life by mere determination. It's not your effort that's going to get you there. It's God's power as it's demonstrated as he reveals it to us. In fact, there's, there's three things about the power that, that he shows us. One is the source. It comes from God. It is that theos dunamis. It's from the Lord. It's not like anything the world has to offer. It's God's great supernatural working in the world and in his people today. It's of God. The second thing is the significance that he talks about. All right, the significance is this. He said, this power that God makes available, it is strong enough to give you everything you need for spiritual life. All right, I'll back that up to the last slide. It's everything you need for spiritual life. And it's all that you need for godly life. Now, think about this for a moment. God says, I'm making the power you need to be spiritual available. You mean I don't have to do it by my own instincts? And my, no, you have to participate. You have to obey. You have to surrender. But God will give you what you need to be spiritual. You can live a spiritually, spiritually vital life. You can live in victory. You can live the abundant life. It's available to every child because I'm making my power available to make it so. But not only for that, for your, to live godly. All right. That's the, the godly living is the Greek word Eusebian. And it literally means to live a pious life that resembles the life of God. The way God would have us con, con, to conduct our affairs and to live our life. So not only do I have everything I need for inner victory, I have what I need for outer victory. I have everything I need because of this theos dunamis, it, it's, its source and its significance. But there's that third element I want to talk to, which is the summons of it. He said this divine power by which he's called us. By his virtue, by his grace, by basically what he's saying. The beauty of Jesus has attracted you to this. You have responded to the virtue, to the glory, to the great grace of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Because you've responded to that appeal from the Holy Spirit and to the appeal from Christ. Your life can be changed. God gives you the power you need. I know that when I first began to really, I think, contemplate and take time to listen to what God was saying to me before I came to Christ as a sinner, as someone who didn't know Jesus Christ. I, I began to listen because the, the Spirit draws and woos us and convicts us. The one of the most compelling and beautiful things of all was to begin to see is I would take time to ponder that Jesus Christ really died for me. He died for me. And then when you look at Calvary, and we just did this tremendous study on the, on the way of the cross, when you look at the suffering Savior, when you see Jesus wounded, bleeding, dying, hanging on a cross, that's an ugly sight, all right? I mean, that, that's a hideous sight. Jesus has been beaten, he's wounded, he's swollen. I mean, the blood is pouring, he's, you know, the stripes on his back, the crown of thorns. It's, the cross was an ugly thing. It was an ugly, it was kind of thing if you, if you were just standing there and were to behold it, your stomach would turn, you know. Your, as the Bible says, your bowels of compassion. You'd be moved internally. But there's something about when you look at the cross, it becomes so beautiful because you realize the dignity and the grace that has, that has humbled itself. Jesus, God in the flesh, and made himself available to become that ugliness, which is really yours. You're the sinner. And he's the Savior, but he took upon your sin. And I believe when our eyes get open, we take long enough to really contemplate and look to the cross. It's, there's this compelling, there's this conviction, there's this, there's this drawing. You know, it, it's like a summons that we've been called to it by, his, by the beauty of his life and by the beauty of his sacrifice you know, to, di to discover him. That, that call that calls us to his power. 
It calls us to his presence. It calls us to this, this new life. He said that life, it, 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 it can be yours because of the, the impact of Jesus' glorious person. I think today, anytime we take time to look to the cross and look to Jesus, there's just something that it, we just discover it, that, that, for lack of better terminology, is just beautiful. Even though in its present state, it was ugly. But it's beautiful because we understand what it means and how it works in our hearts and lives. So what do we have? so that we can be successful. The premise, the basis, the foundation is we have this power of God that gives us what we need for life and what we need for godliness. Now, if we don't believe that, the rest of it's not going to work. If I can't come to the fact and say, listen, I believe that God supplied for me everything I need to live victoriously. If I can't, if I can't agree to that and confess that and stand on that, then the rest of it's not going to work. The rest of it's just me trying to do and carry out some disciplines because he says, I need to add to my faith with all diligence these elements. If that's all it is, then I forget this part, then that's not going to work. Because it's not about me being religious and not about me doing just disciplines in my life. It's about me experiencing the presence, the power, and the glory of God on my life. So this power of God. But also he talks about the second word we look at here is the promises of God. Now, though we have God's power, we have God's promises, all right? That through these, the glory of God, the goodness of God that he's given to us. You know, he's granted these things to us. We have these promises of God. The Greek word here, as we show on the screen, is the word epanglomata. And it's used in chapter 1, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, or First Peter here, and also in three, chapter 3, verse 13. It implies a public announcement, you know, that something's being declared. The promises are being made. They're public promises. These are the promises of God. These are, these are, these are things that, they can, that God has declared openly. There's no secrets. And I know people like to use that in their book titles, the secret of successful Christian living or the secret to prayer life or the, there ain't no secrets here. It's all made open and it's all being boldly proclaimed to us if we would just embrace it. I mean, it makes a nice title, like you're gonna really share something nobody knows about, hey. But this has already been broadcast. And we've been broadcasting it for 2,000 years, all right, since the cross about this great message of the gospel. But God is saying, I'm making you some very emphatic public promises here that are yours to embrace. In fact, let me give you, as we did the, the things a while ago, let me give you three things about the promises that we share here that are important to know. One is, he says, they are conferred promises. In other words, he says, God has given unto us these exceeding great and precious promises. He's, he has given. That means to bestow something. It, it's a unique Greek word which has to do that God has, has bestowed, bestowed something upon you of worth. It's not the normal term in the Bible. It's only used several times. It's not the normal term when we say the word give in English. Many times we just mean give. I, I'm going to give you a million bucks. I'm going to give you 50 cents. All right. But in the Greek language, those words give, there's a difference. When you're giving something of value, like an endowment to bestow something upon somebody, like it's something you're inheriting, that's this particular word that has to do with, with, with receiving something of worth. So he's dealing with the worth of the gift that God gives you. In Mark 15, this word is, is used to talk about when Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and Pilate was, said he gave. And that word is distinctly and uniquely used there. Why? Why, why is talking about giving the body of Jesus? Because well, it was a tremendous worth. It's the vessel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this term, when he says has given or has granted, it occurs in this verse three, but also in, in, it occurs in the perfect tense. What's that mean? It means that God has done something in the past by giving this, but this perfect tense means it has a continuing action. In other words, that God gave those promises, but they're still effective. He gave those promises thousands of years ago, but they're still in, 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 in action. They're still usable. They're still functioning. They're still true. They're, they're still valuable. They're still great gifts. So it's, these gifts have been conferred to us, but he says they are cherished gifts. And in fact, here's the way it breaks down in several translations. The King James says they're exceeding great and precious promises. The Amplified Bible says his, the, his precious and exceedingly great promises. The New Living Translation says his rich and wonderful promises. The New American Standard says they are precious and magnificent promises. And literally Paul used this word, uh, Paul used the word, I mean Peter used the word cherish. There's something that is value, there's something to be cherished, there's something that's unique, something that, that, that is to be prized. He uses that word several times, the apostle does, throughout, throughout his writings from 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 
He talks about our Christian faith. Is our faith is a cherished faith. When he talks about Christ's blood in, in chapter one, he talks about the blood of Jesus is cherished blood. And now when he talks about these promises that God's made, he talks about Christ's promises are precious and they're to be cherished promises of God. So we have this precious faith, we have the precious blood of Jesus, and we have these precious promises. And I know that's probably not a word you use a lot, especially as men, women are more prone to use that word, but what better word to describe the value of God's word and his covenant to us, that it's living, it's alive, it's precious, it's valuable, it's magnificent, it's exceedingly wonderful. That's what these promises are described as. So we have the promises of God. They're conferred and they're cherished, but catch this, and this is the part you don't want to miss. They are the channels by which God uses to work in our life. They're magnificent, they're precious, because they are the means by which we participate in God's plan and it's God's purposes. The Bible tells us we've got this power and we've got these promises. And it's, he stands behind his power and the way we enact that and the way we activate that in our own life is how? Through faith in the promises of God. I have to trust God. I have to believe what he said. I have to embrace what he said. If the Bible is just some kind of another book that just sits around the house and never gets paid attention to, if it's never read, if it's never studied, if it's never memorized, then it really doesn't hold any precious value to me. I mean, let's be honest about it. It's when I realize that something's important, if I really realize the value of it, then I take time with it. And I think that most Christians don't succeed in their life and in their walk because of the way they ignore the word of God. These promises of God that are so precious are not read, nor are they believed, nor are they studied. Occasionally they get to church and hear about them and they say amen about them and we sing about them, but actually to embrace them so that I can, he says, by, by means of these promises, I can participate in the divine nature. That is lost somewhere. The love for the word of God, the understanding, listen to me, of just how important the Bible is, just how important the word is to us. He gives us a little glimpse here. It's by these promises that we can participate. What if I ignore the promises? Then I miss the beauty of the relationship. I miss the joy of knowing Jesus. I miss the beauty of walking with God in my life. So it's important to realize that if we're going to have all these elements that we add to our faith so that we do not become useless and we don't stumble, we make it to the end, we hear the well done, then I better not ignore the promises of God's word. The third thing and the third word in this, in this, in this, this verse that I want to, to point out is this word where it talks about we are made partakers of the divine nature. Basically, it means that we're God's people. We've been birthed into a new life. We have the nature of God in us. And now we're sharing in that nature. We're participating. He says, you have, been, you have these so that you might be participants or partakers of the divine nature. That is that you might be a child of God and you might live as a child of God. This word participate, is a, the root word of it is, is that word koin, uh, uh, koinonia. And the word before that is a word which means you have become. In other words, God has done something in you when you gave your life to Jesus. God has done something for you so that these promises of God's word make a difference in your life. And when you embrace them, when you believe them, when you trust them, you begin to participate in the divine nature. You begin to enjoy the family relationship. You begin to participate in the family of God. Greater than that, you're participating in the very life of God. How do I enjoy my fellowship? How do I enjoy the relationship? God's given me his word to show me how to enjoy the relationship. He's given me his word filled with promises so that I can understand the relationship. And so that it's not just me kind of standing over here and, and God watching me. I think a lot of Christians live their life that way. God's in the, in the balcony, we're down here on the stage, you know, and we're kind of out here on the field and we're trying to do our thing and looking up for approval occasionally. Did I do it right? Oh boy, I blew that. I hope he didn't see that, you know. Or maybe, man, I messed up big. He's going to come down and whoop me, whatever it might be. We just, it's God's over there. We're over, that's not what God intended in Christianity. God intended that you participate in the divine nature. You participate in this new life. It's not about you kind of performing for God, walking the tightrope, hoping, hoping to get everything just right. No, it's about you experiencing Jesus Christ in your life day. He's present in you, to live in you, to fellowship with you, to have a life with you. So we have his power, we have his promises, 
He has made us his people. We now have his nature and he wants us to participate in that nature. And as a result of that, the fourth word here he deals with is protection. We have God's protection. So, you know, we, now that we're, we're, we escaped this corruption, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, a lot of people aren't escaping the corruption. There's a lot of corruption in this world. And a lot of Christians, they start out on the journey, they do real good, but sooner or later they fall in to those things that are appealing from the world. The Bible says those are just corrupting influences and the corrupting forces that appeal to your drives and appeal to your desires. He said, hey, you want to get past that? Those are the things that would keep you from reaching that place of hearing well done. That's the thing that pushes you out of the race. Don't give way to those things. How are you going to overcome those things? You're going to do it by the power of God. Hallelujah. I have the power of God. I'm going to do it by the promises of God. Praise God, I have the promises of God. I'm going to do it by participating. He's changed my life and heart so I can't participate. And the result of that is God's presence is in my life to serve as a protection for my life so that I don't have to submit to these influences of a corrupt world that I live in. The Greek word for corrupt word world is, is, is pitharis. And it literally has to do with moral decay or moral corruption. And we're living in a morally corrupt and a morally bankrupt world, if you hadn't noticed. How do we keep from falling into that hole? How does that vacuum not draw and suck us in? Because we're, li- we're, not, we're not like the rest of the world now. We've been changed. So now we can escape those corrupt influences. Later, Peter talks about in, in 2 Peter, and he deals with on a great deal, about the apostates, the, the make-believers. They're not true believers, they're make-believers, all right? And it says, it says, they'll escape the pollutions of the world. So what's the difference between escaping the corruptions of the world and escaping the pollutions of the world? The corruption of the world is that which, which is within us. Satan, the world, the flesh, all those things that appeal to, to the old nature. The pollution of the world is that which is on the outside, all right? The outside influences. A lot of people deal with the pollution and they deal with it of the world uh, and, and by being religious, you know? And they have, a good, they have a good external story, but, you know... Uh, even while I'm preaching this, there's a lot of people dealing with issues of pollution in the world. We have big debates and summits and global green meetings and all those things. We somehow feel, uh, and I don't know where this comes from, but somehow in the eco, economic and political world, there's a feeling, that an idea and a myth that's generated. If we could just clean up the environment, the world would be a lot better place. You used to have a world full of sinners. That's your problem. But they're breathing better air. <laughs> Or somehow that people would be happier or, or the globe would be finer or the world would be united, you know. And there, there's really a deeper underlying, you know, theme that they're moving towards with that whole mindset and that whole philosophy of living. But hey, we have people every Sunday that come to church and they, they do better, they look good, they, they scrub up, clean up, and wash up real good on the outside and they're escaping the pollutions of the world, so to say. But, you know, still the corruption of the heart hadn't been dealt with. Jesus dealt with the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes. There were many like that whose hearts, he said, you know, you make white the outside of the sepulcher and you deal with the external pollution, but you still need to deal with that internal corruption. And the way we deal with internal corruption is that God gives us a new nature. He makes us new people. He gives us a new heart. Religious people, the make believers, so they just go through little anti-pollution programs like, like every Sunday, you know. If I can just be a little better person, I take care of all these external things, but they never deal with the issue of the heart. If you're going to escape the corruption of the world, you have to have a new nature. You have to be a participator in the the very nature of God. You have to have trusted the promises of God. You have to have experienced that power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power of God that births you into the kingdom of God. People say be born again. You can't born yourself again. God does that through his power. He makes you a new person. Now, the only way to escape the corruption now is with this new nature, all right? You'll need to be a partaker in the divine nature, and then you can escape the corruption and the pollution that's in this world. But mark this down very clearly, folks. Before you get into the rest of this sermon about being useful and about being fruitful and about never stumbling, you got to get this down. This is, this is first base in the game, so to say. If you, you, you can't get to home base if you don't get to first base. First base is know that you know that you're a believer. Know that you know you're a Christian and not a make-believer. Scripture's filled with verse after verse, chapter after chapter that deals with this, this very principle of people who go through a form of Christianity but don't experience Christ in the heart. Paul said there's a form of godliness, all right? But it's not about having a form of godliness. It's about having a heart. 
And when your heart's right, then God gives you the power to be godly. He gives you everything you need for spiritual life and a godly life. You'll get that from God. But if all you're doing is kind of washing the outside and never letting God wash the inside, you're not going to make it. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. And there's a, a lot of people, I, I think, who have some pretty good intentions, but don't get it yet. They don't understand it. They think that Christianity is them trying as hard as they can to somehow satisfy the righteous standard of God. You can't do it. It's impossible. All of sin. Sin has done its dirty work in every one of us. Therefore, we are corrupt in our nature. We need to be changed. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. But if we don't get this issue down about come to the cross, give your life to Jesus. And, and I've talked to many people over my long life now who've given me lots of different answers. Are you a believer? Stuff like, yeah, I'm a believer. I live in America. Says it on the coins and God we trust. Are you? Yeah, I'm a believer. My grandfather was a preacher. My dad was a deacon. Well, I guess if you get by osmosis, is there a sponge theory? I just kind of soak it up in the process. Is that the way it is? My favorite is Brother Joe, I go to church. Well, here's the old adage, you can sit in a fruit bowl, but that doesn't make you a banana. All right? You have to be born a banana to be a banana. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just these external, but I've done this and I prayed a prayer and I raised my hand. And I, I was sprinkled, I was baptized. I went through the, this liturgy thing at our church and I had to memorize this stuff. Now, what did you do with Jesus? How, how is it with you? And Je have, you ever, have you ever come to him and asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you ever invited Christ? In your life? Have you ever turned from the direction you're going and turned to follow Christ? And the key is that once we turn to follow Christ, we begin to understand about this power that's given us this new life through his promises. And we become participants and we experience the grace and protection of God. But if this hasn't happened, then it's futile. I mean, you can be baptized till your skin wrinkles. It's not going to save you. For with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness. And if you haven't got that down, if you haven't settled that issue, then the rest of it's, it's going to be very ex extremely frustrating for you. This passage says God's given you his power and his promises, his protection. He's, he's, he's called you. He said, so you have everything you need to not turn back to make it to the end. In other words, we are well equipped, but we need to believe that. You need to understand about that about yourself, that God has given you what you need to make it all the way, already. He, he is working in you. He's constantly drawing you. He's constantly teaching you. He's constantly instructing you if you've sealed the deal. Hallelujah. And to seal the deal means to turn your life over to Christ. Then you can start moving towards experiencing that spiritual life, experiencing that godliness in your life, experiencing that victory in your life so that you're not stumbling, always falling down, always failing, but you're growing and you're moving and you're increasing in these areas of your life and walk. So if you do these, add to your faith diligent to these areas, you won't be useless. Man, I... I don't want to stand before the Lord and have him look at me and say, well, that was useless. <laughs> you sure? Everything I did, I, you, I gave my life to you. You, I, you even made a decision and you followed me, but that's pretty much useless. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I, I, I don't know the Lord put, would put it that way, but it'd be obvious. Amen. Then it was useless. Our lives are to make a difference. Our lives are to mean something. And your life can mean something probably more than you even comprehend. I believe it's true for any of us. Probably more. One day we're going to be in shock. I said, that's all you, that was, that, all that is what you wanted to do? I thought I was getting there. God's given you what you need. Embrace that. Receive that. Believe that. Enjoy that. And walk in that. And then begin to diligently add to your faith these other elements of your spiritual walking life. What God will do is not just surprise you, he'll astound you with his grace and presence. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Today, I would say to you, it's pretty simple.